Acts chapter 8. And this is kind of an off-base sermon. Um, it's going to aggravate and irritate uh, probably many. Um, unless you're a true believer. It's going to aggravate you, irritate you, convict you. If you're a non-believer, young or old alike, and um, this is a message that we're going to deep into a little bit of magic and sorcery, you know, that Ouija board stuff that we know of and, and the cultic and I don't know, I guess you could just say magic and we often refer to black magic and these kinds of things and we'll be getting there here in just a moment. As you're turning in your Bibles, how many of you in Acts chapter 8, we're going to uh, start in verse 9, how many of you have ever heard of Frank Barassa, the Canadian? Any of you ever heard of him? Well, the title of the message today is Counterfeit Christians. And there's one in the scripture. But I want to tell you about this man. Amazing man. I read his biography online and kind of a troubled kid in school and never really fit the rules and trying to get ahead in life and worked hard and that wasn't making the money for him that he wanted and so forth and so forth. Um, he is one of the most famous counterfeiters in world history. Did you know that? Uh, and he's still alive and doing well. This was only in 2010 era. Uh, he'd done it many years before the 2010. So um, I assume he's doing well for himself. I'll talk about that here in a minute. But he wrote an article about how he counterfeited um, $250 million. Yeah. He never did call me on the phone during those years. Amen. But he refers to himself as the counterfeit God because that's what everybody called him. And he counterfeited $250 million using $20 bills. Folks, that's a printing press. I mean, this guy had it set up. Uh, now, this is what I'm reading online. So uh, this is all I, I know of him. So I am hope I'm, I'm correct in many of this. But it says he had specially developed paper printed at a mill in Germany, done his research, and the ink was shipped to his home in Canada from China, done his work. And so Frank quoted this in one of the articles I read. You have to start with that. It's got this crisp feel. You know how a dollar bill, boy, don't, ain't those new ones hard to get separated and they're so crisp from the bank? He says, if you don't have this crisp feel, then you don't have anything. Well, according to ABC, as they're reporting, Frank's operation had been going on for years. And the first one of his counterfeit bills was spotted in Michigan. Now, this guy was so good, he had the ink, he had the paper, he had the identity strips and the security strips on the dollar, he had all the bases covered. And this guy was actually, you could say, making man or making money hand over foot, I guess you could say. Uh, but there was only one flaw in his system. In 2010, roughly, they began tracking him because he sold one of his counterfeit $20 bills to an undercover agent. Not a good thing to do. So that brought down the house of cards, they say. Uh, $250 million. So when they came and caught him, he went to prison for a few weeks, just 15 weeks, 14 weeks, something, and was back out on the street because he said he would turn in all the money and he was going to open up a security business and help the government, FBI, whatever agencies, to help them catch other counterfeiters. So they agreed. So they confiscated $200 of his counterfeit money. So they asked him, after they'd made the plea deal, 
they asked him, they said, well, where's the other 50 million? He said, ask my lawyer. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you might get one of those bills, but here's the problem. It looked real. It felt real, smelt real. Everything about these $20 bills are real to the human eye, to the senses. Yet, they were counterfeit. And today, uh, many of you are going to see in the Bible this counterfeit man. There's numerous Christians that you meet in life. Aren't they? Aren't they Christians? Well, they walk and they talk. They labor for the church in many different facets of teaching, preaching, different roles in the church, finance, whatever it be. And now I, this is a global uh, type message. This is not just for our church, and I'm not preaching about our church. Um, however, is there counterfeit Christians in our church? Well, uh, Jude and James says they're everywhere. So I can't answer that, but I can tell you that there's counterfeit Christians. Uh, there's church attenders that claims they are saved. There's preachers and pastors and teachers and you name it. Oh, they're saved. Well, they play the part. And a woman asked me one time, she said, are you a real preacher? I said, well, I believe I am. And she said, but you don't look like one. So I asked her, well, what does a preacher look like? She said, well, you know, I don't know. I said, well, it looks like me. Amen. But there are so many counterfeiters that we run into in life. And... I know the $250 million from Frank in $20 bills. Boy, that's the greatest counterfeit in history. I'd have to disagree with that statement. I think the greatest counterfeit in history is one that claims to know Christ when they truly don't. So as we go into the scriptures today, these folks, the counterfeits, alive and well in the church, members attending, whatever it may be. They're very religious people. They're on the spot. They're on the point. They got all the T's crossed, the I's dotted, and all of these things, and they're just serving God. They're religious in their flesh. Can't happen. God doesn't accept that worship and that service. And many I've seen that has been counterfeits, and I've got many, many stories on this. They have smiling faces. They're humble. They're easygoing. They dress up nice and smell good and look good. And Oh, man, yeah. And deep down inside, they have a black heart. So we're going to talk about Philip here. Uh as he's going and traveling to Samaria, Philip the evangelist. Now, we talked about him a while back. That's when he was in the book of Isaiah, quoting uh, to the Ethiopian eunuch. But here is a whole different situation. Same Philip, a different man. If you would, please stand to reverence the reading of God's word in his house today. Amen? Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. And we'll begin reading down through verse um, 13, Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he was some great one. To them they all gave heed, that means their attention, from the least to the greatest, that's talking about society. Uh, this man, saying, has the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip's preaching on the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So here you have Simon. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And then you have Philip. And look at verse 13. 
Well, it seems like the problem solved. We could go home early. Look at verse 13. Well, Simon himself believed. There we go. He was even baptized. Done deal. Let's say amen and head to the house. Well, wait a minute. I've seen that profession before. And he continued with Philip and, and wondered, uh, beholding the miracles. Um, he was amazed is the wonder. Beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Father in heaven, Lord, as we read a portion of thy word today, and Father, I pray that it's not head knowledge, but it, Father, that it goes into our hearts, it sinks in deep, that we can know and understand thy word, that we may walk and live a life that is pleasing to you. Father, I pray this is not a message against anyone, but it is a message of concern and love for a fellow man that calls themselves a Christian. Father, I pray if there's one here today that's not a true Christian, they don't have to be dabbled in magic and all of those things, but if they're not a true Christian, I pray today would be the day that they would come and believe in you. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. And everyone said, Amen. So here comes Philip, the evangelist. He's coming down to Samaria. The Jews are being dispersed. They're being scattered. And here comes Philip. And he, in verse 5, he is not one that's telling you a bunch of stories and a bunch of garbage and a bunch of who wow He is telling you about Christ. The scripture says, and he preached Christ. Philip, the no-nonsense evangelist, here he comes. He's on scene. And this people in Samaria, pardon this expression, half-breed Jews, you know that we've uh, taught about this before, that the, the Jews didn't like them because these Jews of Samaria was kind of Hellenistic, which means they're kind of not a full-bred Jew in the sense that they've also adopted not only by blood, but they've adopted Greek practices and stuff like this. The Samaritans wasn't nothing to the Jews, and, and the Samaritans didn't like the Jews and so forth. And here is Philip preaching Christ to these people. Already it seems like Philip's back is against the wall. Oh, no. Look what takes place here. Uh, here uh, but there's many unclean spirits, it talks about. And there's, there's a loud voice that come out of many who were demon-possessed. There was paralyzed people there. There were crippled people there. And they were being healed. They begin to see the miracles of God and begin to believe in Christ. Now, you have to understand when you read here that we talked about the kingdom. Philip is preaching Christ and telling them about his future kingdom. He is given the message of the gospel. These people are seeing the miracles, believing in what they're seeing. People were being healed and it said many. And then arose one called Simon. Well, it seemed to be a closed case. As we read, he believed and he was baptized, right? Well, let's look at this. Look at verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time, which means formerly in the same city, uh, the city of Samaria. Is it a city in Samaria or the city of Samaria? I'm not really sure, but it's there in Samaria. And, and he's been astonishing. He's been wowing the people. I mean, who couldn't turn on David Copperfield and see the Empire State Building or something disappear. I don't remember. Elephants in weird places, all this. Who couldn't see? I mean, it's, now I'm not saying these people are evil, but sleight of hand. Simon wasn't sleight of hand. Simon was the real deal. And we see him here in the scriptures. And he was amazing and astonishing the people in what he could do. Well, he was giving out himself as some great one. He didn't have to tell you he was great. When you saw this man perform these, not sleight of hand tricks, but this true magic, you would think that he's some great one. Well, of course you would. Look at what this guy can do. And wow. So we see here that Simon, uh, now Simon also was called uh, Simon Magus, 
that was kind of like the historical. I'm not really sure where that name came from, but he's Simon the Magus. If you transliterate that, he's Simon the Magician. A real magician. Real magic. And so Simon the Magician or Simon the Sorcerer, you can say it's the same thing, not only did he amaze you, but when you look in the words of the text, he also would make you fear him for what he could do. This man had to be amazing. But you know, as I read in this passage, he had all of these tricks from Satan. He had them all stored in his head and heart. He knew them, and he knew how to put the power forth from the evil one to amaze and have the people fearing of what they're seeing. So the people begin to say, this is the power of God. No one can do these things. And yet, why did Philip have to do so many miracles if this man was so great? You see, when you start to apply God's word to any situation that you see, hear, feel, touch, whatever, it begins to quiet the amazement, the fear, the astonishment, and you begin to say, something's not right about him, something's not right about her. You might not be able to put your finger on it. You see, and people likes to, in the flesh, be entertained with all of these people that can supposedly walk on water and make elephants disappear. And Man, you know, that's such an attraction to the flesh. But when you start saying, whoa, this is the power of God, put the brakes on. The power of God doesn't make elephants disappear. The power of God is going to, dis, uh, to be displayed in order that, number one, you may believe in the power of God. That's why it's displayed. Number two, to edify the church in this book of Acts. None of that, making a building or something disappear, or nothing that anyone that I've ever seen in the Bible or claiming today edifies the Christian, the believer, the church. Nor does it encourage me to serve God. But it does wow me. Man, how could he or she? You ever seen the woman in the box that's cut in half? Whoa, when I was a kid, I was like, I wonder if they had a doctor in there that sewed her back together. I was just a young and I didn't know, but I was wild by that. My cousin used to be able to do card tricks. Man, he would never show me either. All of that, these people, I don't know what the, all these people are seeing, but these people loved what they were seeing. Now listen, let me ask you a question. Do you believe in demonic power? If you do, say amen. If you don't believe in demonic power, then don't believe in godly power. You see, dynamic power is in this sorcery and magic here in the scriptures. It's in other things, of course. But here in this sorcery and magic, this is demonic. This is not by any stretch of the imagination one fingernail thickness of the work of God. So, but it is wowing the people... And you know, when you see, now let, I'm going to kill all of your magic shows here, all your little uh, shows that's on TV of magic and so forth. I really don't see very many of those, but I know they used to be on when I was a kid and watched stuff like that. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians, even him, it says in chapter 2, verse 9, even him, who? The Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers, signs, and wonders. Didn't we just read that? You see, 
don't think of something that's, oh, that's that old devil, demon stuff, that Christians talk about that, that's stupid, the preachers. You better watch yourself. If God puts this in his holy word, then you better be careful because it is real. The power of darkness, the demonic, the horde uh, in, called in the book of Revelation. But let's, let's move on here. So Philip here um, was preaching. Philip is preaching Christ and Simon is promoting his self through miracles, signs and wonders, magic. And so he had been manipulating the people so long uh, they, they just assumed that we said that this was the great power of God. Now look at verse 13. Then Simon, well, himself believed. Well, believed who? Well, believed something. You say, well, you don't know what he believed? Well, I believe I do. But the other people, the many in Samaria are believing in Christ, the preaching of um, the coming of the kingdom, and they were baptized because they believed. Well, you said Simon believed, but it didn't say that Simon believed in Christ. It also said, well, he was baptized. Okay, you got wet. That doesn't mean that you're an authentic believer. It should. But here is Simon. Now look here in verse 13. Oh, he continued with Philip. Well, why would he continue with Philip? Well, you say, well, maybe he's going on him on a missionary journey going forth. No. No, he, he didn't continue with Philip very long. Look at verse 13 again. And he continued with Philip because he himself was amazed beholding or seeing the miracles and signs which were done. What did he do? He wanted that power. He see the, the lame and the crippled walk. He's seeing something that he's never seen before. Philip is healing people. And Philip is casting out demons that were in the people. He had never seen this power. So he's coming forth. Oh, he believes. He goes down into baptism water and he clings right back to Philip and says, man, I got to get me some of that power. You know, a lot of people, they hang around the church. They see the power of God. They see the power of prayer. They see Christians as totally devoted to God. But yet some people hang around the church just like an old breadcrumb. They just want to feel. They want to include their senses. They want the church as a backdrop in their life. And, you know, it's good to go to church, isn't it? And they attend. They become members. Because that's the right thing to do. Isn't it? Well, let's look at Simon. So he's continuing with Philip. There, there's many verses of many people that were believing the gospel and being baptized in Jesus Christ. Why does it say Christ? Because the people believed that he was the true Messiah. And what did Simon believe? He was amazed by the power of God. He was fixated upon that. The signs, the miracles that Philip was doing. He wanted some of this. Simon believed in vain. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 or 2, somewhere there. It talks about that people can believe in vain. Oh, they want to believe and they've got to believe. Well, you've got to believe in something, don't you? Well, let's give this old church thing a whirl. Whoa. Whoa, that's when you're making decisions in your life that you will be held accountable for. Better believe it. 
Now, so be careful. As they say, tread lightly. So, look at verse 14 through verse 17. Now, when the apostles, now these are the 12, uh, or the now would be 12. Uh, Judas, of course, is not with them no longer. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they're having a great revival there. And you know, when you have good preaching, good revivals, good worship, good messages, good singing, and you're praising God, who do you think is going to show up? That's right. The devil himself. And oftentimes... You, you don't see, if you see somebody coming through the back doors back there with a red suit on and a little tail and a pitchfork and all. No, no, no. No, no. When you have the Word of God that is present and it is convicting and it is real and you know it's real, if you are one that is a counterfeit Christian, you're going to bring up the flesh in your heart and mind and you're going to reveal those things and denounce the power of God. Ah, uh, preaching was, yeah, it's all right. What do you mean it's all right? It's the Word of God. Yeah, church service. Eh, yeah. This is the Lord's house that He died for and purchased with His own blood. What is wrong with these I'll tell you what's wrong. That's a counterfeit worship. If you are worshiping in the flesh and you go back home and I've heard people have nothing but negativity about the Lord's church. That is a shame. How you take the man of God to Sunday school teacher whoever sung a special the choir <laughs> That is the flesh. Now, not everyone that would act like that is lost, but they're not close to God, I can tell you that. Because God's word never returns void. If you are void, it's because you're not listening, you're not paying attention, and you're not serving and worshiping. Amen? This is his house. This is the power of Christ. I was on the church, or on the way to church, I think this morning I was leaving the house. And I said, uh, Laura was asking me some questions. And I said, well, you know, I've probably been preaching some 30 years, you know. And I never have figured out and learned enough. If you get to a point where you think you've learned all that you can learn, come spend some time with me. I'll show you some things. Not because I'm anybody great. But I was asking, I said, you know, I've been preaching for a long time. And she said, well, you're 57 now. Thanks. And she said, you've been preaching or you have been studying the Bible for 31 years. Feels like I just began. Because that's the power of God. Well, let's get moving on with Simon here. So here's Simon baptized, verse 14. Um, here comes Peter and John, verse 15. When they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is not something that the people was doing wrong, nor Philip. This was a plan of God for Peter and John to come down and pray for these people and lay hands on them and receive the Holy Ghost. That's how it worked. That's, this is the occasion that where God worked this way. Uh, look at verse 18. Oh, when Simon saw not believe saw we don't walk by sight, but by faith. Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Oh, there's, oh, look at there, you see. Look at the power there. These people are changing. What's going on? And, and these two big men that are apostles or something has come down. And what's going on? Look at the power here. Not once. 
did Simon mention that Peter and John and Philip had prayed for these new believers or to become believers? No, no, skip all the prayer, skip all that kind of stuff. Let's get to the juice, let's get to the power. Woo, yeah. No. That's not how God works. So he saw the laying on of the apostles' hands, and the Holy Ghost was given. He did observe that. And so what did he do? He offered them money. And he said this, Give me this power. And he pulled out his wallet. That so if I lay hands on someone, that they may receive the Holy Ghost. Peter and John that walked over three years with Christ at this time, no doubt had a broken heart. Well, as we continue here, um, he offered them money. The scriptures never say that this was given to Simon. He offered them money so he could receive the Holy Spirit, lay hands on what he could see, what he saw, all about the glim and the glam, all about the what they call it, the blam or what they call that nowadays. What's it called? The glamour. That's old school, brother. We got to get new. Oh, that's fire. Is that what? Yeah. See, that's what I would say, glamour. He's all about it. You think if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you were just baptized that you're going to offer money for the Holy Spirit? Verse 20, 21, and here's where we begin to close. Now watch. Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with you. Simon's going to perish? That's what was said by Peter. Because you have believed or thought that the gift of God can be purchased with money. And you believe that's how God works? He operates off the principles of the flesh on how much you can give? That's how God works? Now, in the original language, you say, now the Bible always speaks good and always is wholesome. It's true. I didn't say it didn't do that. I said it was true. In the original language, where do you go when the Bible talks about one perishing? Tell me, where do you go? Where do you go? What does perish mean? You're going where? You're going to perish if you go before God in heaven? Mm -mm. Where are you going to go to perish? Hell. What did Peter just tell Simon? You can take your money and take it to hell when you go there with you. Mm. Never thought about that in the Bible, huh? Not cursing, of course not. That's what Peter is saying. He was so furious and brokenhearted at this. Verse 21. You don't even have a, a lot or a part in this matter. You don't even have nothing to say. Nothing, nothing you can do. This is, this is not about you. You don't have nothing at stake in this. You Nothing. You take your money with you when you go and you perish. And then he says this. For your heart is not right with God. <laughs> you see? 
Now, I've heard this preach that Simon was a wonderful man. He got converted and he wanted to go on missionary journey. This man's heart, Peter said. You are not right in your heart with God. You see, a counterfeiter can be an amazing looking disciple, follower, believer, churchgoer, attender of Jesus Christ. They got all the parts covered. But deep down inside, their heart is not right. They can hoop, they can holler, they can preach, they can teach. All out of the flesh. They can learn the Bible, but they'll never experience the Bible. Because their heart is not right. Well, we've got to close here in a moment. I want you to just take a sneak peek at verse 23. You say, well, you know, I don't know. You're praying pretty hard on this guy. Uh, he's an unbeliever. Well, it says your heart is not right. Look at verse 23. You are in the bond of iniquity. What is one of the first things that you're taught when you believe and trust in Jesus Christ? Whom the Son sets free is free from what? From the bondage of sin. Simon was still under the bondage. Simon played the part, looked good, but truly was a counterfeit. Galatians 5 and 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty or the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Romans 6, uh, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For sin shall have no more dominion over you. You are not under the law, but you are under grace. And then, I've preached on this many years in the past. I've seen people cry. I've seen people scream. I've seen one woman that was standing on the second pew and she was back and we were having a, a close to the service. And I read this verse and that woman fell to the ground. Fell right to the ground. Hit her back on the pew and fell right to the ground. What was she doing? Screaming. I've seen people nervous and shaking when, when I read this verse. I seen a man in the back of the church to tell his wife, where you could hear it in the closing, to tell his wife to shut up because he's not going down front. If he's lost, that's his business, and she needs to shut up. And they was in a screaming match. I'm pointing at Carol back there, but Carol, it's not you. I've seen... All kinds of things result from this. Let me read you this verse. In Matthew, I've um, got the verse here. Don't even spend your time turning there. I want you to listen. Jesus is speaking here. Not everyone that saith or talks to me and says, says this, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not right, Jesus. Oh, it's right. Because Jesus said it. What was Philip teaching? Jesus and about the what? The kingdom. Philip was right on the mark. And then, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Oh, so if we go out and we be religious and we work for, no, no, no. You can't start running until you learn how to walk. 
And in the scriptures, the Father's will that he does not want anyone to perish, but to come to righteousness. That's the will of the Father. Many, many will say to me in that day, what day? The day of judgment. Many will say to me in that day, and Jesus said many, not me. Jesus did. Lord, Lord, <laughs> have we not prophesied in thy name? Lord, we, we prophesied. We, we spoke of the future and the prophecies. And we told people about you. And in thy name, have we not cast out devils? Oh, Lord, look what we've done. We've helped people. We've casted out demons. Prophesized. Preached. Proclaimed. Taught. In your church, Lord. And in thy name, a definite article be for each, and in thy name, in thy name, in thy name, listing their works. In thy name, we have done many wonderful works. Okay. And then Jesus replies to all of these people that are speaking. And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. I don't know you. Depart from me because you're still in your sins. Folks, if we don't know Jesus Christ as our Savior, don't worry about the rest of it because it means nothing. Worship, praising, preaching, teaching means nothing. They could be wonderful works. Jesus said, I don't know you. And he says, because I don't know you, you, you have, or don't know you, you have to depart. Your reserve seat is in a different location. Folks, this is such a troubling scripture. And not for the believer. To the believer, it is a verse of scripture that we can use to tell others that believe they're so highly religious to tell them that religion doesn't work. It's about knowing Christ. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's, he's teaching this. Jesus is on the mountain. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Lord, we was a good preacher, a good pastor. Lord, a good Sunday school. Lord, we, Lord, we were missionaries. Lord, we did. Done many wonderful works. And this is what horrifies Man, I can see a crowd coming up in judgment. And I can see myself and the old self raising my hand and saying, because this is all I had, saying, Lord, uh, I was about this young man's age, a little bit younger. Lord, I, I attended a Methodist church. I'm not downing the Methodist church. I attended there. 
I, I, my uncle used to drive the bus there at the church. And, and we, well, Lord, I went to the church. And Lord... They had one of the greatest sports football teams there ever was. And I got to play football. Lord, that's all I had. Here is the horrifying part. Here I am. I can see myself in my old life. And me holding my hand saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Look at what I've done. And when he, now this is in my thought, when he would turn and look at me, when our eyes would meet, he looked completely through my soul and didn't know who I was. <laughs> 